It's been a few years since I've sold bulk books on Amazon, uh, but there was a few months where I did about 160 pallets worth of raw, unsorted books that I got from, well, I'll tell you where in the story. And I just kind of want to go through and talk about how I did it, how I got into it, everything that I'm asked pretty regularly. Uh, and then I'll also share some introspection about what I would do differently, because certainly now, there's a lot of things that are different um, about selling on Amazon and selling online in general that I think are going to um, impact, I guess, the kind of advice I give. And hopefully you can use this as a jumping off point for your bulk book business. Um, I've st I still sell books. I sell, I have about, I don't know, 2,000 listed right now probably. So a much smaller scale than what it was previously. Um, and then before I was doing truckloads of books, I was also scanning books from bookstores. You know, everything is always in motion. It's always fluid. I was just talking to someone the other day about how VCRs used to be like the greatest, hottest thing. And I was selling, you know, 150 VCRs a month and now maybe I'll sell 10. So it's all not cyclical, but it's all fluid and in motion. And if you can figure out when to enter and when to exit markets, you can make some good money. Or conversely, you know, if you can just stay in the market and tweak your business to, um, you know, cater to whatever uh, benefits there are around you or, or, you know, ways to make money more or less, you can do pretty well. Uh, and so I guess it's about 2019. Um, and I had been selling a lot of books on Amazon. I had purchased individual pallets, maybe eight pallets at a time, uh, from, from, uh, third party distributors. And it was a mix of, you know, Amazon returns, half books, half other stuff. And that could be a whole different video in itself. Uh, but I really wanted to get into bulk books selling, you know, doing a, a, a massive quantity. Uh, and so I figured that the best way to do this is to go straight to the source. And so I went online and I saw a bunch of websites that offered, you know, pallets of books and some were dead, some weren't really existing. Some were trying to sell them for like four or 500 bucks a pop. And that's way, way, way too high. You can't really make money selling books, you know, buying pallets that much, unless the books are like all textbooks and they're all very expensive. The pallets of books I was buying, you get about a thousand books per pallet, give or take. You know, if it was large books, it'd be lower. If it was, um, you know, small uh, mass market paperback books, maybe you'd have 1,200. But we'll say, you know, about a thousand on average, give or take. Uh, they were tall, they were stacked over, they would be uh, have like a, a plastic wrap over the top of the pallet to keep them in, and they were double stacked in truckloads. Uh, and so I had no luck with the websites. And eventually I began calling thrift stores and I said, can I just buy books from you? And most of them said, no, uh, you're going to have to talk to a regional person for this or a manager or something like that. And there's a lot of dead ends, probably, you know, obviously the last person you call for these kind of deals is always the one who works because you don't call people after that. But I'd say I had about, I don't know, 15 or 25 just dead ends before that. Uh, and finally I get a hold of the, um, receiving donation manager or supervisor for the Detroit. It was Southeastern Michigan Salvation Army. I think it's called ARC. I don't know why it's called ARC, but that's what it's called, A-R-C. Uh, and I got a hold of that person. And I said, can you like email me some quotes or how much books cost or whatever? And at the time, they were selling them by the pound. And I think I paid about 10 cents a pound, which is more than they could get for recyclers. Yum. It was, at the time, they were paying about six cents per pound to buy paper. Paper recyclers were. And I believe it was being exported to China. And they stopped doing that, and so maybe they don't even buy it anymore. I know in some areas, they're still buying paper. And in some areas, you can't even recycle paper, and you have to pay to have it destroyed. And so that's, you know, a whole other expense. But I didn't have that. I was able to sell it to a local recycler for, like, six cents a pound. Um, and on the pallets that were full of duds, you know, make a little bit of money back. Um, it ended up being about two thirds of the books that I went through, I could sell for at least a quarter profit on Amazon. And I'm going to go at the end of the video, talk about why that's different now and how things are different than it was before. But at the time I was okay. FBA books. If the sales rank was below about a quarter million, if it was a quarter profit all the way up to 1 million, if I could get $1 profit, um, and so I was buying truckloads, going through them all. Now, here's the bad about it. The bad was 
I was uh, I had to get a warehouse. I was renting from my family basically because that was the only way I could do a month to month lease in a warehouse because I didn't know if I was going to do this long term or how it was going to be. So the only month to month warehouse I could get was an hour away from a family member of mine. Now somewhere if you live and you know there's lots of month to month warehouses, maybe this is a perfect business for you, but for me around here Everything is at the minimum one year, and most of the commercial spaces are three-year leases now at this point, which is um, pretty pretty high. That's pretty long, I think. Uh, and so that was kind of a pain in the butt to drive an hour there and an hour back every day to go through books. And I was working, you know, five or six, seven days a week, eight or ten hours a day, and plus the two hours driving time. It was just absolutely terrible. Uh, however. It definitely was profitable. Um, like I said, most of the books, by far, you know, probably 95% of the books were less than $5 profit and probably 60% of the books that I w would sell. So about two-thirds of the two-thirds of all the books were like $1 or less profit. And these at the time were raw, unsorted. So I was FBAing all of these. And this is one of the differences that I guess, again, we'll talk about later. But I was FBAing all of these. And so that $1 profit wasn't taking into account any long-term storage fees I would have. So I did have to be pretty uh, aggressive in my pricing. I was using a, a repricing tool called Reprice It at the time. Uh, and so I would call the Salvation Army, Southeastern Michigan Salvation Army. I'd talk to someone. I'd say, okay, I'd like to buy a truckload. And then uh, they would deliver up to 40 miles away, I think maybe 25 miles away. I was just outside of that range. So then I had to use a shipping company. I was using Freight Quote. You can use lots of people. And I would pay, I think it was like maybe four or 500 bucks to have them deliver a truckload an hour. And basically that was just the delivery fee. And then I would use a forklift to unload the books, basically. They would remove them, or no, they would back up the truck to the, the, the ramp. And then I would go in with a forklift and pick them up, pull them back, drop them in the next room and just do that. Uh, and it would take an hour and a half maybe because I was not very good <laughs> at driving a forklift. Maybe you're better than me. It's not, you know, it's not a, a difficult skill, but um, I was a novice at it. A lot of, you know, inching back and forth because when one of those pallets, you know, I, I call them pallets. What, they're, what they really are is pallets with gaylords of books, but we'll just call them pallets for this video. For one of those to fall over and break, it's like a half hour to clean up. It's a long time and a lot of the books are ruined and it's just you don't want to do that. Not that all the books were always in good condition because a lot of those books either, you know, they had rodent damage or they were moldy or they were destroyed um, and you couldn't really sell them. So I did this, I would get in there and I would sell all the books individually and the books I couldn't sell individually, I would sometimes lot up maybe like with 40 or, or 80 like science fiction paperbacks or kids books or how to read books or romance novels and you would get about a, a dime per book with shipping. It was really not a very good way to make money but I had to get rid of them all uh, because that was my main choke point was I was the only one working I was the only person doing it okay so that's what I did I did 160 pallets you know about maybe a few more and um, I quit doing it because it just was way too much work I was getting sick all the time just because of the dust and the mold in the books and I've got allergies and I was wearing a ventilator but it was still just like I'd get rashes on my skin and it was bad it wasn't good. Um, maybe there were things I could have done to make it cleaner, but it was just a lot of wear and tear in my body and my like my mental health, just with all the driving and working. So although it was profitable, it wasn't profitable enough for me to keep sacrificing my body. I have no clue how much I made. Um, I think it was like around $6,000 a month profit after all the fees, after all the shipping, after gas, after all that stuff. Uh, but it was working like, you know, with the drive time, what felt like a hundred hours a week. It was, you know, my, my whole, all my energy was going to that. Uh, and so I stopped doing that. I still sell books. I'm much, much, much more picky now. Um, typically I either sell books that are very old and cool or very valuable. Um, if you've been following the channel, I did a hoarder house clean out and I probably was too, I don't know, I took too many books, whatever you want to call that. I wasn't discerning enough with my taste. But now, when I go out and buy a book individually, it's got to make me at least like 15 or 20 bucks just because, you know, that's my where I'm at now. 
if I would do bulk books differently, here's how I would do it. I would hire people. Now, why didn't I hire people back then? I didn't have the money, quite frankly. And I didn't feel comfortable telling someone they had a job if I didn't know if I was going to be doing it long term. I don't want to say, oh, yeah, you can work here. You know, 40 hours a week, we're going to be doing this forever. And then stop doing it in two months like I did because that's a pretty, a pretty bad way to be a boss, I think. If I were to do it again, though, um, I'd have to have more space. I'd have to have more employees. But I do definitely still think it's possible. Why more space? Well, because now with the way FBA works, you can't really load thousands and thousands of books onto Amazon and then FBA them all. They don't let you do it. I mean, there are people who have uh, massive bulk book businesses who are like 80% eBay at this point or Merchant Fulfill. So not only eBay, but also Merchant Fulfill, meaning they ship it out themselves. Um, I'd have to hire people. I would do a, a lot more focus on bundling by author and by genre. Uh, you know, probably I'll just recycle all of the cheap mass market paperback books. And I think my minimum profit per book would be would be a dollar, which is about seven bucks uh, on eBay and about eight bucks on Amazon. Merge fulfilled. I would do it that way. Um, I think, again, I wouldn't want to pay more than like a dime per pound um, on bulk books. And it'd be really difficult because, again, in my area, I'd have to pay to have these books recycled. Uh, I guess maybe if you were, you know, the kind of person who wants to find ways around stuff like that, you could just burn the books. That's how you'd heat your warehouse. <laughs> but I don't know if that's legal. I don't know if it's a good idea. And I don't know if it's necessarily safe. But that's what I would personally have to do. Um, I think realistically, you'd be have to do like a truckload per week. I think that's, ha that's how it'd have to be in order to pay for, you know, one or two employees. You couldn't pay him more than like maybe 15 bucks an hour. Maybe you could, but I don't think you would be able to, depending on like how much you're uh, paying for warehouse and utilities and that kind of stuff. And the business would be heavily reliant um, upon eBay and Amazon merchable filled sales. So you have to train them up on how to do all that stuff. And on top of that, you have to have your own inventory system. And what I'd recommend doing is something numerical where like when a book comes in, the first book is one, the second book is two, and you just kind of go out and build your inventory that way. And once you hit the end of your space, you reset and just fill in the gaps uh, inventory wise. Because any other system, trying to do it alphabetically, trying to do it by genre, trying to use like some kind of, you know, like the Dewey Decimal system, that'd be just way too difficult. You have to go in, you know, first come, first serve uh, in terms of numerical stock keeping units or SKUs. So as I'm editing the video, I realized I didn't talk about how I scanned the books. I had a Bluetooth scanner, I get to my phone, and I was using Scout IQ. And I had my trigger set up, like I said earlier, at uh, 25 cents for under a quarter million up to a dollar for 1 million sales rank. So if uh, the, the sales rank of a book was under a quarter million, if the profit was a quarter or more, it would flash green all the way up to a million. Uh, now, I have no clue what your triggers would be. I think probably I would have my triggers at like a dollar for 100,000 and everything else would have to be a separate trigger for a merchant fulfilled. Because like I said, Amazon doesn't just let you load their warehouses full of books like they used to, you know, four or five years ago. And uh, that's what I would do. That's why I got into it. That's why I left. Hope it was helpful. Thanks for watching, guys, and I'll see you later.